What is up, everybody? Welcome back. Today, I am super excited to share with this Neo gang, all you Neo fans out there, something extra special. I'm going to be putting on my best YouTuber affect, getting all extreme with a hyperbole. I'm making zoom cuts, putting a really sweet clickbait, stupid thumbnail out there. And I'm going to be telling you everything I hate about my Neo EC6. But before I tell you everything I hate about my Neo EC6, let me tell you about Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a free to play mobile video game that does not pay me a dime. So I'm actually not gonna talk about them, but if you do subscribe here, if you do smash that button, then you're gonna get more Neo content and maybe in the future I can tell you about Raid Shadow Legends if they decide to pay me. So, okay, but for real now, I've had my Neo for about two months, a little over two months, and I've put over 15,000 kilometers on this car. Now I think I'm finally in a position to give you a more proper thorough review of the vehicle. Now, to be fair, I really love the car. It's by far the best car I've ever owned. Pretty much any way you look at it, it beats anything that I've ever owned before. However, it's not all good. And in today's video, I'm gonna show you everything about the car that I don't like or that I think could be improved. I'm going to be starting with the biggest, most important issues as I see them. And as we move on down the list, it will become more and more nitpicky, scraping the bottom of the barrel type of issues. Let's give it a goo. By far the biggest problem that I have with the EC6 is with regards to the visibility out of the rear passenger side. Now forgive me if my nomenclature is incorrect here, but I believe that I'm referring to the C pillar area. I have mentioned this in a previous video, but in some situations it is nearly impossible to see into potentially oncoming traffic coming from this direction. Thankfully most traffic generally isn't coming from that direction and with the safety features provided in the side mirror, it is mostly a not an issue, but when you do need to see in this direction, it really can become a major safety concern. I really hope that in future iterations of the EC6 that they are able to make significant improvements in this area because from my perspective, it's quite dangerous at times. Next, Neo Pilot. Another issue I've mentioned before, but the car sometimes, not often, but sometimes, suddenly seems to slam on the brakes while driving at highway speeds. This isn't due to a change in road conditions or speed limit. A lot of people commented, oh, it's probably the speed limit change. But no, literally there's no, no changes to the road conditions, to the speed limit, to traffic. There's no car in front of me, nothing. I guess sometimes perhaps that the car thinks it sees something that it doesn't. But again, the car just will at times just suddenly slam on the brakes. And it's really highly unnerving when it happens. And it's potentially another safety concern, just like the poor visibility of the rear passenger seat. Thankfully, this hasn't happened to me when I've had traffic following closely behind me because if it had, I would most assuredly already have been rear-ended by now. The latest software update has made improvements to NeoPilot, and the patch notes even mentioned strong braking on turns as something that has been fixed. However, I haven't had a chance to test the NeoPilot much since the update, so I can't tell you if it's been fixed to my satisfaction just yet. Okay, next is mileage rating versus real-world mileage. In China, they use the NEDC rating, which according to reports, overestimates real world mileage by up to 30%. A full 100 kilowatt hour battery from NEO will get you 615 kilometers per charge according to the NEDC rating. However, after extensive use, I can say that I usually get somewhere in the range of 400 to 420 kilometers per charge while doing primarily highway driving with and with the air conditioner set to a reasonable temperature, maybe around 22 degrees Celsius. When I say I get 400 to 420 kilometers per charge, I'm not driving all the way down to zero. The Battery will usually tell me I still have maybe 40 or 50 kilometers left to go, um, but I'm not gonna drive it down zero, like I said. I, I would guess you could probably do 440, maybe 450 per charge, but um, I would say in typical use scenario, you're looking at 400 to 420 kilometers per charge, whereas it's rated for 615 kilometers. Now, what I would love to see, and maybe other cars do this, I'm not sure, but I would prefer to see if the car could learn my driving habits and then provide an estimated range that more accurately reflects how I drive the car. Uh, when I fill up the battery, charge the battery, and I see 615 kilometer range, that doesn't really mean anything to me. Now it means something to me because I know that's actually gonna get me maybe 420 kilometers in the real world. But after putting 15,000 kilometers on the car, I wish that when I did charge up the battery that the projected mileage would actually be able to accurately reflect what is happening when I drive. I wish it could learn and be smart and adapt to what is actually happening in the car. Those first three problems that I have with the EC6 that I just noted, those all relate to the driving experience and I think those are all quite important. I think that in the future, if they can improve on these things, it would make for an even better driving experience for the Neo, which already has a great driving experience in my opinion. Now, the remaining problems that I'm about to go through are a lot more nitpicky and they're not really related to driving, so let's get into it. Next, I have problems with Nomi. To start, I really like Nomi. I think she's cute, she's helpful, she's really fun to interact with. However, she's not perfect, and I'm not without a few minor complaints. 
The first and probably the biggest complaint for, that I have about Nomi is that she does not have enough animations. For example, when music is playing, she has two animations I, as far as I've seen. She'll either play her guitar or maracas. And it's just an animation. It's not, she's not actually playing music, okay? Both of these animations are very cute. I like to see them sometimes. It's, it's, it's fun. But she really doesn't match the music. I don't see why she can't play her ac acoustic guitar while folk music or country music plays. And then when maybe you play a rock song, she busts out an electric guitar and puts on a bandana. Um, or maybe when rap music plays, she grabs a microphone. I know that everything these days has metadata associated with it. Music in the metadata, it tells you the genre. So I think that they should be able to program Nomi to animate in a way that more closely relates to what is actually happening through the speakers. Now, to make matters worse, I actually, I listen to mainly podcasts and some audiobooks, and she can't even parse that I'm not listening to music. She still animates like music is playing. Don't get me wrong, I know this is very trivial, this is very stupid stuff. <laughs> it sounds stupid to me right now saying it out loud, but I do think that she should have more animations for different scenarios and she would be a lot cuter and a lot more fun to interact with. Now, another issue that I have with Nomi is that her little motor is quite loud. So another, it's another trivial thing, but when you say, hi Nomi, and then the in-car audio will automatically turn down so she can respond to you. And then you hear her little motor whir uh, as she swivels to look at you. I feel like, uh, you know, Neil gets compared to Apple quite a bit, but I think Neil lacks that really, really, really perfect attention to detail that makes Apple very unique and makes their fans, you know, so loyal. I would bet that if Apple had made a Nomi or a robot like Nomi, she would be almost near silent when she moves. And it's those kind of details that really, in my opinion, make a difference between like top of the line and good. Okay, moving on next. The mood lighting and the trunk lighting and the SOS light, pretty much any of the interior lights. Again, this is stuff is not really that important. And I would say that this actual category right here is more subjective than anything else that I talk about today. Pretty much all of the interior lighting on the car, I have a little bit of issue with. So first is the mood lighting or the accent lighting or the rim lighting. In Chinese, it's called Finway Dung. Now, I actually really like this lighting. I like that it allows you to customize your ride based on your mood, how you feel. I find myself driving at night sometimes, and uh, I usually put the, the accent lighting, the mood lighting on. Sometimes I turn it off, but I usually have it on. I think it's really nice. However, I think the design here is lacking a little bit in just a very small way. Now, if you look here, the lighting doesn't extend all the way around. I'm guessing that this is some kind of engineering or maybe a cost of material problem, but I would think that it's not an intentional design decision. I would prefer personally if the lights didn't stop at these junctions. I think that it would look a lot nicer without any breaks of the lighting. But again, that's very subjective. So next we have the trunk light. The trunk light is not useful at all. It's off to the side, there's only one. It's not powerful enough to do anything. In my opinion, uh, at the very least, you should have two lights in the trunk, one on each side, and they should be more powerful. But even better would be a light on the inside of the trunk door that when you open it up, it points down into the trunk and it shines down into the trunk space. So you can you know, go through your suitcase, your luggage, or find whatever's in the back, grab a water bottle, whatever. Uh, during my road trip, I often found myself in the dark at night, you know, maybe charging my, my car and setting up my bedding. So I'm digging through the trunk and I'm just, you know, I'm mad. I'm cursing at Neil for not putting better light back there because I cannot see anything. It's pointless. The light makes no difference whether it's there or not. And then finally, the last light I want to talk about is in the front of the car, there's an SOS light. Now I covered it up with black electrical tape because it really bothers me. Uh, at night when it's dark, it's really bright. It's really, 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 really bright. Like it's probably just me being sensitive. I'm thankful that if I do crash or fall into a lake or something in some kind of emergency, that I will definitely be able to find the SOS button and hopefully somebody will come and save me. But if there was any kind of way to turn the brightness on and down, I would do that in a heartbeat, but I can't find any way to, to adjust the lighting there. So I just covered it up with electrical tape. All right, next is the dash cam and the in-car interior cam. So this is another safety feature. And I'm, I'm grateful. I don't want to sound like I'm ungrateful. I'm grateful for the dash cam. If I was ever in a car wreck or if someone tried an insurance scam on me and jumped in front of my car, I would sure be glad that it was there. But aside from if you need it for insurance purposes, 
The in-car dash cam is really pretty bad quality, actually shockingly bad in my opinion for being a luxury car. Another problem with it is, as far as I can tell, it doesn't record any of like the in-car data. Like if I did get in a car crash, I would love to be able to know how fast I was going or how fast the other car was going. And I know that technology is available. I actually bought a dash cam for 600 Kwai and put it in the, in the car because it, it does provide more information and it's a better camera in general. But it provides speed and time of day and you can even have it um, track other cars on the road and that sort of thing if you want. So I'm quite shocked that the Neo, if I did get in a wreck and I, I wanted the dash cam footage, um, I'm sure you can sync, I'm sure there's a way, I'm, I'm sure there's a way that Neo and their onboard computer and they can sync all the information, but I personally cannot sync the information as far as I can tell. So I think that uh, they should put a better dash cam in there and you should be able to see at least some sort of data about what's happening in the car as you drive. If you want, you should be able to toggle speed, time of day, that sort of thing. Another problem with the dash cam is the only way to get the video out of the car is actually by plugging in a USB stick and then downloading it. It seems like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi would be a better way or even uploading to the cloud and then downloading the video via the Neo app, just like the in-car camera does. Actually, and speaking of that camera, uh, it's probably not, <laughs> it's probably best not to speak about it because it's actually a really poor quality camera as well. You know, the position of it's actually really bad. It's too far forward in my opinion. So it's really close to the driver and the passenger. Very, very, very wide. So now you're all stretched out and plus the camera's just not very good quality anyway. It's poor image quality. And so it's not, not really useful. Now, if that camera was pushed back a little bit, a little bit better, maybe a bigger image sensor, just a bigger, better quality. And then also if you could record video from it, even if it's short clips, like maybe if you were doing Uber or something in the future in your Neo, and you have a passenger that's unruly, you wanna record some, some video from inside, that would be cool. But as far as I can tell, you cannot actually record any video with the in-car camera. So I feel like, again, a luxury car, if they're gonna put a camera there, take pictures, they should put a good camera there. All right, getting down to it. AR360 camera for parking or for getting through tight spots is very, very helpful. I really like it. But what I don't like is how sensitive it is for triggering. And what I mean by that is that the 360 view automatically will open to show you your surroundings when objects are nearby and you are driving slowly. However, so many times I swear it's just a shadow on the road or something dumb like a bush or a bike lane divider uh, next to the lane. And then the screen jumps into the 360 view. It wouldn't be a big deal. And well, it's, it's really not actually a big deal. But when it does launch into 360 view, it turns down the radio. Now, again, I like to listen to podcasts and audiobooks, and, you know, I'm hearing, I'm listening to a story and then suddenly the sound cuts out. You can see how annoying this might be. Believe me, I'm well aware that a lot of people, when they back up or when they're parking or going slow, they automatically will turn down the radio. So this feature is probably actually good for most people because I've seen it so many times people turn down the radio in situations like this, but to have it automatically turn down the radio, for me, it's kind of annoying. It wouldn't be a big deal if it was less sensitive to trigger, but while I'm in like city traffic, when you know, you're sitting there bumper to bumper traffic and like every, it seems like I swear every minute when you're waiting on a red light, car will pull up to you and then the 360 camera triggers and your radio turns down and it's just kind of annoying. I feel like it's too sensitive. Next, the movie screen and speakers and Bluetooth. Now, uh, again, another not a real problem, just a minor annoyance. And I bet I could probably actually fix this one if I was better at navigating Chinese menus. But every time I get in the car, my phone automatically connects with the car via Bluetooth, which is what I want. However, I need to click click two times to get it to actually play what's coming out of my phone. The car audio always defaults to the standard music player app, which is QQ Music. Again, I could probably adjust this, make it save it to my profile, but I haven't been able to figure it out. I really hope the English language operating system will come out as soon as possible so I can get into the menus and fix this sort of thing. Now next is uh, watching movies in the car. Now, for example, while your car charges, you're sitting there, you got nothing to do, maybe you wanna watch a movie. But this movie watching experience is not great. Now, because the Neo screen is vertical, the movies don't take advantage of the size of the screen, obviously, they're played in widescreen. So this means there's, most of the screen is gonna be just off or black. Again, it's not really a problem. I don't think anybody really plans on watching a bunch of movies in their car. I know I don't, but uh, I did watch two movies during my road trip uh, while the car was charging. And besides having the in-car audio with surround sound, which is quite nice, the experience of actually watching a video in the car is probably not even as good as watching on an iPad. I think the iPad screen is the same and I don't have to stare at the middle of the car console. I can go sit somewhere else or 
get out of the car, whatever. Kind of actually a pointless feature. I guess unless you have kids, which I don't. Okay, almost done, two more. Next is the wireless charger for your cell phone or your device charger. In the Neo, this charger is not very good, at least in my car. Maybe other Neo owners can tell me what you guys think about this. I think maybe I got a dud. At home, I also use a wireless charger with my phone. I'm able to charge my iPhone, you know, from whatever to full in a couple hours. It's not super fast, it's not like a cord, but it's fast enough and it charges my phone. Now the charger in my EC6 is fully capable of keeping my phone charged, but it's not really capable of charging my phone. If that doesn't make sense to you, then let me explain. If my phone is like, for example, 60 percent full and I go driving for two hours and I put my phone on the charging pad pick up my phone after two hours it'll still be at 60 percent or maybe 61 or 62 at best of course I'm not using the phone while I'm driving it is connected to bluetooth to the car speakers playing a, a podcast maybe but I'm not talking on the phone I'm not texting people I'm not picking it up off the charger and putting it down and picking it up and putting it down that's not happening the phone's just sitting there so it should charge now I slept in the car multiple times during my road trip at night while the car was charging during this time, I'd also put the phone on the charging pad. And when I woke up the next day, the most power I ever had in my phone after you know a full night of charging on that pad was around 70%. So after like six or seven hours of me sleeping, not touching my phone, uh, maybe it'll go from 30% to 70%. Um, so obviously not great. It's not gonna charge your phone. Again, if any other Neo owners, particularly EC6 owners are out there, please let me know. Does your phone actually charge on that charging pad? All right, and last but certainly not least, um, not exactly a problem with the car, but a problem with, I guess, Neo. Now, everything these days is on the internet. Everything is, um, people buy stuff through apps. People buy cars through apps. I bought my car through an app. What you see on the screen right now is the color of the interior that I bought of my car on the Neo app. The name of the color is Himalayan Brown. In the AR viewer on the app, which you're looking at again right now, it's definitely a darker shade of brown and less pink than what actually I received in my car. Now I should have searched on the Neo app prior to booking the car to find a showroom that had this color interior on display in a real vehicle. You can do that. You can see which Neo house or which Neo space has which cars, which interiors, which models, everything, which trims. Um, so if you do want to go see, you can go see. I should have done that. However, I trusted that the app wouldn't really be that far off from reality. I know that every phone is going to have a different color balance and brightness, but I do feel that the color in the real world of the interior is quite a bit different from what is being sold on the app. I would again say this is probably my fault for spending you know $60,000 and not going and actually seeing the product in reality, but there wasn't one nearby and I didn't really feel like going too far away to look at it. I felt like, oh, it's gonna be the same as the app. And in the end, it doesn't matter because I actually do like the interior of my car. I think it's nice and uh, when people see it on YouTube, they say, oh, it's really pink. And it is, it is pink, but it's not as pink as it is on YouTube, I don't know. You know, it's again, it's the color of the of real life versus the digital representation. Um, so again, it's just like the AR is different from what I saw in real life. Just like what you see in the video is a little bit different. But I would choose a different color probably. But I'm still quite happy with the color I got. I don't mind it at all. And then finally, lastly, the most minor thing possible. But I ordered a black key fob when I ordered my car. And I got a silver key fob for some reason. And again, this doesn't matter at all. It's a key fob that I put in my pocket when I go to drive a car. It doesn't even come out of my pocket. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to put it in the ignition. There's nothing like that. However, at the same time, it isn't what I ordered. My order says a black key fob and I got a silver key fob. And when I picked up the car, I was probably too excited to notice that it wasn't the right key fob. I wasn't really paying attention to that little detail. This is again an example of the attention to detail that I think separates a really great company and really great service from one that is just good enough. And so I feel like part of it's my fault. I didn't get the right key fob. I wasn't paying attention. But at the same time, when you go pick up your car from Neo, I feel like they should have their checklist where they run down point by point what you ordered and they check it and they prepare it before you come. And then they don't put the, the onus on the, the person coming to pick up the car to make sure it's correct. But I also should have made sure it was correct. But ultimately, I don't care. It's just a key fob. So that's it. Those are everything I hate about the Neo. As you can see, there's not really too much that I actually dislike about the car. But I do hope that some people from Neo actually will see this video and at the end of the day they will look at the constructive criticism that I have and probably other owners have and have provided to them and then we'll continue to iterate on the car and make improvements. I feel like Neo can only improve from where they are now to where they're going because they're a brand new company and they're already making such amazing cars. So let me know in the comments below what you think about all of my complaints. Do you think that they're justified? Do you think I'm being silly? And please make sure you like and subscribe if you haven't already, because I'm gonna be going with 
a similar video to this, but everything that I love about the Neo in the very, very, very near future. So thank you as always for watching. There's ways to support me below if you want to do that, but you really don't have to. So take care guys. Bye-bye. Peace out. See you next time. Say